we have inner awareness, why does it feel like something to see a Picasso painting, hear a Mahler symphony, smell fresh garlic? What seems to be the most obvious thing on Earth may be in fact the most mysterious thing in the universe. It's called consciousness, and throughout my life I've been obsessed by it. Obsessed because every explanation seems bizarre. Obsessed because consciousness is the ultimate test whether there is anything apart from the physical world. In 1994, when I first heard about the Tucson Conference toward a science of consciousness, with most leading thinkers attending, I wanted to attend. Over the years, there was always a reason why I did not. In 2014, the conference's 20th anniversary, I finally did. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to Tucson and toward a science of consciousness. I'm invited by one of the founders of the Tucson Conference, Dr. Stuart Hameroff, an anesthesiologist and passionate pioneer of consciousness studies. I've known Stuart since 2003, when he appeared in a Closer to Truth episode on consciousness. I'm thrilled to be here in Tucson. I see many old friends. Sue Blackmore, Dave Chalmers, Deepak Chopra, Dan Dennett, Rebecca Goldstein, John Searle. All superstars of consciousness, all participants on Closer to Truth. Have their views changed? Do they have new ideas? I search for Stuart to get the history of the conference. I find him in the exhibition hall amidst the blizzard of kaleidoscopic ideas on consciousness, from the hyper-scientific to the weirdly spiritual. Not to be a killjoy, Stu, but none of this explains consciousness or moves me much, though I love the passion. Stuart, 20 years, the conference a great success, uh, to your credit. Uh, as you look upon these 20 years, the development of the conference, but also its impact on how literally the whole world looks at consciousness, uh, how do you reflect on it? 20 years ago, uh, the study of consciousness in the scientific framework was just beginning to come out of the shadows of behaviorism, which had uh, dominated psychology and neuroscience uh, for most of the 20th century. <laughs> People like Roger Penrose, Francis Crick, uh, Gerald Edelman wrote books in the 1980s that began to make it somewhat respectable, but there hadn't been any uh, interdisciplinary conferences. There have been conferences in philosophy, in Eastern spirituality, some in neuroscience, but nobody really uh, brought all these together. So we tried to do that in the 1994 conference under one umbrella, under one tent. The first conference, the first day was philosophy, and uh, we had uh, well, two well-known philosophers speak first. They read their uh, talks, and the interdisciplinary audience grew very restless and bored. <laughs> Fortunately, the third talk was by an unknown philosopher named David Chalmers, who jumped up on stage and started strutting and prancing like Mick Jagger, talking about the hard problem. And... Uh, the easy problems were memory, attention, behavior, reportability, and so forth, and those were very difficult. But the hard problem was a whole nother ball game, and he made that point clear, and everybody kind of got it at that moment. At the coffee break, people go, oh, the hard problem, that's why we're here. At that moment, I think the movement galvanized and kind of brought everybody together. Huh. I first interviewed Dave Chalmers in 1999, then again in 2007, he has cut his long hair. I hardly recognize him. Dave has become an acclaimed philosopher, tackling many issues, but consciousness remains his core. 30 years ago, there really wasn't a science of consciousness or even much of a philosophy of consciousness yeah. to speak of. Not many people were working on it. It's just mushroomed over the last 10, 20 years. Some of the mushrooming has been in the science. There's now an incredibly active yeah. Neuroscience of consciousness, for example. People are working on the neural correlates of consciousness, the brain areas specifically that go along with different kinds of conscious states. 30 years ago, I don't think you could get tenure yeah. working on the neural basis of consciousness. Now there's actually a respectable research program. How do you account for that? 
I think it's because people actually found good experimental paradigms for working on it. They do things like studying binocular rivalry, send different signals to one eye, mm -hmm. see what people report being conscious of, and then measure the neurons in the brain that go along with what they report being conscious of. And it turns out you can do science. I see the science as kind of an integration of objective data about the brain and about behavior, looking at the system from the third person point of view with subjective data, what we experience from the inside, that is consciousness. And then we report that and we say what we're experiencing from the inside, that's first person data. So you put together the first person data about consciousness with the third person data about the brain and behavior and it turns out you can do some science. In principle, is it possible for neuroscience to explain the hard problem? In principle. What I would say is, on its own, no. That is, if you want a complete explanation of consciousness in terms of processes in the brain, and that's all, no. Processes in the brain will explain things like the functioning of brain systems, the behaviors we produce. But when it comes to consciousness, those are the easy problems. The hard problem is the problem about subjective experience. It looks like just telling the structural, dynamical story about the brain always leaves open a gap. Why is all that accompanied by experience? Why doesn't it go on in the dark? So my view is you've got to supplement neuroscience by something like further fundamental principles connecting the brain processes to consciousness and find that fundamental theory of consciousness. Well, you know, progress in philosophy is Dave has come a long way from when we first met on Closer to Truth. A roundtable discussion, a debate actually, with John Searle. John's here too, and I can't wait to see him get his take on progress, or lack of it, in getting at consciousness. John is a distinguished philosopher of mind, language, and more. He's one of my heroes. He has appeared on Closer to Truth more than a dozen times. John, you've been thinking about consciousness for more than half a century. You and I have been talking about consciousness for 15 years. Has any progress been made? <laughs> well, a certain amount. A lot of progress uh, in these issues is negative. Uh, certain obvious mistakes, I think, are um, less and less likely to be made. Uh, so, for example, when we first started talking about this, the standard view was consciousness, well, that's a computer program running right. in your brain. Yeah. Now, I've been attacking that view for 30 <laughs> years, and, and I, I don't know if these attacks have any effect, but I hear that less. Now, I think people are more likely to respect the brain as an actual biological organ mm. and to think of consciousness as a biological phenomenon. Uh, so that is a kind of progress that certain sorts of mistakes uh, get avoided. Uh, behaviorism is another one. You used to hear, well, there isn't any such thing as consciousness, it's just behavior. Right, right, and that's right. all we can do is investigate behavior, but you don't hear that much anymore. However, that's the good news. The bad news is we don't seem to be making an awful lot of progress on figuring out how exactly does the brain do it? How exactly does the brain produce consciousness? And partly that has to do with the fact that the brain is an extremely complicated mechanism. You've got 100 billion neurons and God knows how many zillion synapses, and we really don't yet know what specific uh, brain processes are responsible for consciousness. However, we're getting closer. Now, those look up are we? Each other, are we getting closer to explaining consciousness? There's sure a proliferation of competing explanations. I should survey the landscape. I asked Stuart Hameroff for a tour. Stuart, lay out for me the spectrum of thinking on consciousness because the conference itself really mirrors the richness of the diversity of ideas about consciousness. It kind of starts with how you look at where consciousness is in the universe. Um, most views in modern science would say that consciousness emerged as a product of evolution, right. some kind of adaptive process related to information processing in nervous systems, right, for example. Right. On the other hand, you have people like Deepak Chopra, Eastern spiritualists and, and idealists, who would say consciousness has been in the universe all along. It's built into the universe and everything in between. So that translates on the one hand to the most, I would say, conservative view that of eliminative materialism that would deny the hard problem that consciousness is is essentially equivalent to computation in the brain among neurons. And then uh, you move a little bit uh, 
towards materialism, uh, again, emerging from complex interactions among uh, particles and matter, for example, neurons firing on the brain. And then there's a bunch of views having to do with, with how it's organized in the brain uh, that combine uh, philosophical approaches like higher order thought theory, uh, access versus phenomenal, right. conscious versus non-conscious, right. global workspace, which is kind of the uh, theater metaphor of where it occurs in the brain. And then our view of going to a deeper level inside neurons, a deeper order, finer scale processes within the neuron, uh, increasing the capacity of information, but also uh, reaching the quantum level where if you reduce uh, further than reductionists normally do, you get to the quantum level and you get non-locality and things spread out. So, you know, in our view, reductionists don't go, don't reduce far enough. Mm -hmm. Moving along the spectrum, I'd say you have integrated information theory that is less based on the neuronal structure uh, than we are, and then idealism. A actually, before that, I would put the traditional dualism, where, where, which is believed by probably most people, yeah. at least in the religious world, uh, not necessarily the scientific or philosophical world, that there's two separate real entities, a physical and a, and a, and a spiritual or soulish kind of world. Right, going back to Descartes. Yeah. We're in the middle. Uh, we, uh, we believe that uh, consciousness in, in some form has been in the universe all along, at least as, as proto-conscious events, and the brain evolved mechanisms to access and connect to it at a deeper level. Such divergence. Nowhere else in science do possible explanations differ so dramatically. The size range for locating the seat of consciousness is staggeringly large from subatomic quantum physics to sweeping, reverberating brain pathways to cosmic consciousness encompassing everything. A radical account gathering adherence and gaining strength confirms how deep, how intractable the problem of consciousness really is. Dave Chalmers is one of its champions, and he is here in Tucson as if a kind of missionary. The mo perhaps the most interesting development in philosophy in the last few years has been the really serious development of what people call panpsychist approaches to consciousness. A little bit of consciousness everywhere. Consciousness is present at the ground level in physics. Even a photon has a little bit of consciousness. Okay, it sounds a little bit crazy, but it turns out to be one way to get consciousness inside that natural order of the physical world, playing a causal role without somehow dangling outside it as something totally different. Here's my theory of the, of the hard problem. You're not going to solve it without at least one crazy idea. <laughs> maybe two, maybe three. And you know, different people have different crazy ideas. My friend Dan Dennett, he's got a crazy idea. His is, there is no hard problem. Maybe there's not even a, this distinctive datum of consciousness to explain. <laughs> that requires going, you know, going way out on a limb in one direction. <laughs> on the other side, take consciousness as fundamental, yeah? That's going out on a limb in another direction, but it turns out that once you do this, then you can make progress. No hard problem? How does Dan Dennett explain that? Dan's one of my favorite philosophers, and I'm excited to meet him again. Two decades ago, Dan's book claimed, Consciousness Explained. Not many here agree. Maybe not any here agree. Give Dan the soundbite of the conference. He said that he felt like a policeman at Woodstock. I push him on all these radical theories. Dan, we're here in Tucson, 20th anniversary of the conference, where you expected science to add more and more credibility. At least the opinions I see have diverged from that. Am I seeing the phenomena correctly? Well, you're seeing the phenomena that are on exhibit here at the Tucson conference, for sure. This is a very inclusive tent. <laughs> it's a zoo. And uh, a lot of people, it turns out, this is their life, is thinking about consciousness, and they tend to in elevate it and inflate it into something that's so supercalifragilisticexpialidocious <laughs> that science just is stands slack-jawed in awe of it. Well, I think that's preposterous. So one of my roles is to be a deflator and say, come on, come on. The phenomena are not, they're, they're fantastic, but they're not that fantastic. We're working on very good theories of consciousness uh, that don't consider consciousness to be the ultimate uh, distinction in the whole universe, which I think is, is a bit of, of anthropocentric hubris, if ever there was one. <laughs> what I see is a, a struggle by smart, dedicated people who 
are not satisfied with a a, a, a neuronal level, biological yeah, level yeah. of consciousness. It would be foolish for me to just give the back of my hand to them and say that they can't possibly be right. They could. I just think they're under-motivated. What motivates them is a, a sort of moral anxiety with what they see as the, as the poverty of a straightforward, conservative, scientific theory of consciousness. They don't want that to be the case. Why don't they want that to be the case? Because <laughs> yeah, they're, that they're be afraid the that if, if it's the case, then life has no meaning or morality will <laughs> disappear. Or something. I think that's a poverty of imagination on their part. I mean, I, I find that more and more of my time is spent trying to show people that the account of free will and love and dignity and emotion that you get from the conservative, scientific, materialistic approach is plenty rich. It's, it's predictive, it's explanatory, and people say, but then we're just meat machines. We're the most fantastic meat machines you can imagine. You have an impoverished view of the possibility of meat machines. To Dan, materialism explains everything and consciousness is no exception because consciousness just isn't that special. To Deepak Chopra, consciousness isn't just special. Consciousness is everything. Consciousness is all there is. The only thing that truly exists is consciousness. Dan and Deepak occupy opposite ends of the consciousness spectrum, from the wholly physical to the wholly mental. Why does Deepak think reality is pure consciousness? To see the full spectrum, I need to know why. I think uh, as people have tried to solve the so-called hard problem through neuroscience, they end up being stymied, uh, they get frustrated. The two most open questions in science. Number one was, uh, what is the stuff of the universe? What is it made of? And number two, uh, was what's still the biological basis of consciousness. So my response to that is the stuff of the universe is non-stuff and it is consciousness. And the answer to the second question, what is the biological basis of consciousness, is the wrong question. Biology is an emergent property of consciousness. There are only two experiences we can say, two things we can say categorically, which I think no one can deny. Number one, there is existence. Okay, I agree. Number two, there is awareness of existence. Could they be the same thing? There is only consciousness. The universe is consciousness. You cannot get behind consciousness. Where is imagination? Where is intention? Where is insight? Where is intuition? Where is creativity? Where is time? I mean, these are very fundamental questions and you can't get behind the fact that they're all experienced. These are experiences in consciousness. We have no theory today that tells us how we experience anything. To Deepak, consciousness is fundamental. It's what reality is. All is consciousness, full stop. I like extreme solutions to the hard problem of consciousness. Sharpens the issues, clarifies the contrasts. I go find psychologist Sue Blackmore, irrepressible as ever, one of my favorite materialists. When I first met Sue in the middle 1990s, she was debunking parapsychology in which she had formerly believed. Regarding consciousness, Sue has problems on both extremes. And personally, I would say that the extreme materialism and the extreme idealism are utterly doomed. If you're a solid materialist, you can't explain consciousness. That's the hard problem. It looks insoluble. It seems to me it comes about from making a mistake right at the beginning. If you're an extreme idealist, well, the same. If it's all consciousness all the way up, well, how can you explain the fact that we agree about these chairs and we can do experiments? You can't. But in principle, can neuroscience solve the hard problem of consciousness? In principle. I don't know. If, if I look forward to think what's going to solve it, one possibility, and I think this is on the whole where I'd go, is 
It's a false problem. We're deluded into imagining that there's a conscious self in here who has a stream of experiences uh, that goes on all the time, and it's a persisting self that's me, and it has free will, and it has consciousness, and, and so on. Now, those intuitions, I think, are false, but they feed into this idea that there's something called consciousness itself that is separate from the, the stuff going on in the brain. That's dualism. That's a form of duality that doesn't make sense. So somewhere in there, we may get the neuroscientific breakthrough that, that, that stops it being mysterious in that way. Or another possibility, I think, is that we will so come to understand how the brain works that somehow our, our, our worry about it slithers away. So there are people who say the experience of this red just is the firing of neurons in B5 and the whole system through the, you know, color opponent system and all that. that it, that's what it is. Identity theory. Yeah. And, you know, I go, yeah, yeah but mm, I, I don't get how it can. How can it be? <laughs> I just don't get it. And they would say, well, it's like saying light. I mean, don't be embarrassed, light. Sue. Nobody like gets it. Um, In fact, admitting you don't get it actually means you do get it. You really appreciate the vast explanatory gap. I love this stuff. That's why I caution myself not to get too caught up in the intellectual extravagance and true believer euphoria of the Tucson Conference. Everyone here in Tucson seems so certain, one way or the other. I'm not so certain. Am I the only one without a clue? I turn to philosopher novelist Rebecca Newberger Goldstein. What does she make of all this certainty? When people disagree on, oh, even, you know, naturalism versus theism, or in philosophy of mathematics, or in the interpretation of mm. quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. amazing passions um, come forth. And I think what we have in philosophy is questions that are underdetermined under by all the available facts. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why they're philosophical. They're not scientific. That we can't. We're not waiting for a new fact that's going to decide this. And so, when you're disagreeing here, you're disagreeing on a character, characterological or temperamental mm, mm, uh, mm, level, mm, mm. and it and it explains the passions that are are put forth. Much more is at stake. Um, than just a, a, a scientific disagreement. And there's neuroscience giving you, mapping the different areas for in information processing and trying to get a finer and finer description of what is actually going on there. But will they ever uh, be able to tell me, when I, we get a complete description, if we, if we do, um, you know, do you see red the way I see blue? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, if we do know everything, will that still solve the problem? What's your feeling on that? Okay, so I have two different views about this. One is, I call my much more despairing view, and that is, you know, we are mechanisms for processing information. These processes take place in the brain. Um, and we can understand everything about these processes except why it feels like mm -hmm. something right, right. to do this. Uh, and that is simply a contingent fact about the brain processes that we have been bequeathed by natural selection. So we're never gonna get there. The, my more optimistic view is we are material things and we've been attacking the problem of, you know, what are the properties of matter uh, to infer the properties of matter that we don't observe, but we can scientifically access. How? Through mathematics. And it only means that we await a new Galileo that's going to give us a new way of accessing the properties of, of, uh, of matter, and then maybe we'll be able to get to it. But it, it, all it takes is extraordinary genius. I love being here. These are my people, consumed by consciousness. The divergences of our explanations are less relevant than the commonality of our passion. As the conference closes, I consider five ways to explain consciousness. One, neuroscience alone. Some say we are getting close. Most, that we have a long way to go. Two, radically new physical domains, such as quantum mechanics or integrated information. 
Three, something beyond the physical world as we know it, a new force in nature such as panpsychism, or even beyond physicalism. Four, consciousness is fundamental, bedrock reality, all is consciousness. Five, human beings evolved to survive, not to understand consciousness, so we never can. Toward a science of consciousness 20 years on has established consciousness as a legitimate subject of study. But I depart Tucson slightly depressed. While I treasure the quest, I despair the prize. I'll likely never understand consciousness. I shall be telling a fib if I claim I'm closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.